All right, we're recording. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. This meeting is being recorded. This meeting will be conducted by remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. I will call the meeting to order and go ahead with a roll call just to double check that we can all, we're all here, we can be heard. Uh, so Anna. Hello everyone. Present, sorry. Dorothy. Hello, here I am. Paul. Present. And Athena. I'm here too. Wonderful. And I'm here as well. Okay, so we have a, a quorum. And let me see. I do not believe we have anyone. Let me see. We do. Oh, Shani. Hi. Shani, can you hear us? We hear you. Okay, wonderful. So Shalini has joined the meeting. Uh, and I believe we have one attendee with us, uh, Myra Ross. Thank you for being with us. If you would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand now so we can bring you in the room. No? Okay. All right, so I am going to, with that, I am going to hand the floor over to Anna so we can review the stream. Anika, she has a hand up. Oh, it, okay. Um, hold on just for a moment. It says I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? We hear you. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I actually hadn't planned to make a statement, but since you invited it, I'm uh, the chair of the Disability Access Advisory Committee, and I uh, don't think we have anything in writing at this point for you about the streetlights, um, but we did discuss it at our meeting in March, and um, we did not, uh, we, we said that what they seem to be proposing at that time, although I haven't seen the latest uh, iteration of their proposal, um, we didn't have any problem with because they weren't discussing the placement of the lights, they were discussing the characteristics of the lights. And um, we were fine with the yellow, we were fine with the down facing, we were fine with everything that they seemed to want. But for us, the most important part about the placement of the lights would be that they um, having to do with safety of pedestrians, safety of bicyclists, um, essentially making sure, especially with the condition that our sidewalks and streets are in, that people's safety isn't compromised by darkness mm -hmm. and that people aren't going to be spilling out of wheelchairs because they, they couldn't see that the sidewalk mm -hmm was really not in good shape. So that's essentially what we thought at the time. We don't have any information about any changes to the proposal if there were any. So that's it. I don't have anything in writing for you, but I wanted you to know where we are. Okay, thank you, Mara. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening. And if you would like to stay with us in, in the audience, we are about to get into that discussion now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you. So we have been discussing this for a very, very long time and I'm hopeful that now um, we have come to a, a resolution and a path forward here. As a reminder, what's in your packet today, there's two marked up versions. Um, the What we are talking about and voting on, and I, I hope that we are able to vote today, is not uh, changing anything that the policy is saying about, about location of streetlights, except for the only uh, addition, which is that we uh, generally, we added regional transit bus stops that was not in the policy before. So uh, if you look at Amherst Streetlight Policy uh, 2023, there's two versions and um, you can see the marked up uh, 
the the really marked up and the clean versions uh, for your for your reference. That's what we would be voting on tonight. I also included in your packet a memo to try to to provide illustrative examples of what it is that we're talking about. I know that there's terms in this that aren't necessarily part of the everyday lexicon, and so for for the average person, and so I wanted to provide. Uh, some visuals and some examples. So I'm happy to take questions if folks on that memo, if folks needed uh, needed clarification or explanation, anything that's in there. But otherwise, I, I want to make sure that we are very clear as a committee. This is not about this is not about the placement of the streetlights. This is about the technical specifications. And please, only what what we are voting on is only the policy that's in the packet today. Uh, and so I ask us to to remember that. I think that this conversation has gotten really twisty because we initially did propose something different. So I, I really want us to to have that document up and be looking at it so that we know what we're to, what we're discussing. And I'm happy to share my screen if if folks want it literally up, but um, I wanted to open for questions first on the memo or the policy itself. Okay. But it was clear, crystal clear. Thank you for that. Shalini? Yeah, um, so one is the concern that Tracy has raised about 11 p.m. Um, that the street lighting shall be dimmed to no more than 70% by 11 p.m. or within one hour of the end of closing time of the last bar. Um, so that from the safety point of view and then also from like have you all shared this policy with uh, businesses downtown like in terms of process uh, how are you getting feedback from the community so we're gathered feedback from the community the same way that we gather feedback on every other proposal um, and so this has been out and on the agenda and requesting public comment we have not walked around specifically to ask businesses um, and the uh, in terms of the dimming, I think that it's it's important to look at the light levels. 70% is still relatively high. Um, and so if you look at the light levels, I didn't include examples of dimming, but those are easy to, to search. Um, they came up when I was pulling this together. And so uh, I think I can I can look quickly if, uh, if folks would like me to try to find an example, but dimming to 70% to, um, is, is still an illuminated, uh, an illuminated surface. It's just not as bright of an illumination. Um, and those, the areas that are most heavily trafficked it would still be lit uh, until that, that later time frame. Um, and as well, bus stops are, would, would, be, um, would be lit as well. I think since it's impacting people, like for me, it's hard to say 70% is good enough. And for you to say, unless we've heard from people, how it's gonna impact them. Um, and that's why I think this should be a public forum or some sort where we are more formally inviting the businesses and um, you know, disability committee seems like they don't have the latest draft or TAC or all of the, I mean, I know we already heard from TAC, I believe, but I, it yes, sounds- disability committee has doesn't have the latest and then plus like having a public forum before we as a committee vote i would like to hear from businesses specifically i'd like to hear from um the police chief and fire and you know all, all the safety personnel we have reached out to the safety personnel that they were part of this process as we went along okay so they're fine with this they did not have any, this is not a, a large variance from our current policy and um, other than the, the specifications, the, um, the police did not have any concerns. We did not, I don't believe we reached out to fire specifically. I have to ask Mandy if she did. Okay, yeah, but uh, that would be my proposal is to at least have a public forum where we invite, specifically invite people who represent businesses then and maybe the fire, get feedback from the fire staff. I'm, I'm personally, I don't, I don't know where I'm struggling with that, Shalini, is that, you know, everything we do is impactful. And so we also want to be able to, to get things done. And so I want to make sure that we are, we're considering the, the implications of that. And if that's what you're also proposing, it, in my mind, means that we're, we would be doing a public forum on every single thing that we address, because all of this is about changes that impact, the, I mean, our, our whole job is changes that impact the public, right? And so I think that if if the committee votes to do a public to hold a public forum on this, then that's that's the committee's prerogative. But 
um, in my opinion, that would mean that we are setting a precedent that we will do a public forum on every other um, proposal that comes forward. So I just, I, I think that's in my mind, that's where uh, that leads, which if that's what the committee wants, that's fine. I think we as a committee have to come back to the community engagement project uh, uh, proposal that I had. And now that we have done this whole CRC thing, we do have a plan for that I want to bring forward. But I think we as a committee have to decide which, like you said, we can't do it for everything, but perhaps things that do impact and why I think this is an important enough thing that we should engage the com uh, community is because, you know, we are struggling to revive our downtown and there is a fear, it may be a perception and not an absolute thing, but there is a fear about parking in certain places. And if you're thinking of dimming it even by to 70%, you know, it creates a perception that it's not safe or is it gonna harm the, the people who are now trying to come to Drake or we're trying to get businesses downtown and shut dimming the light, it kind of feels like the vibe is like, oh, okay, good night, everyone, we're going to bed now. So, I mean, I want to understand not mm -hmm. your perspective, I've heard your perspective, but I would like to hear the perspective of uh, specifically businesses. Great, and I do want to clarify that the um, the dimming is is after all of that. We were very intentional when, when we were writing this that I want to make sure I read the exact sentence um, that the downtown, um, boop, boop, boop. I'm finding the exact case. And then 70% by 11 or within one hour of the end, within one hour of the end of closing time of the last bar or live music. Yep. So, so that the idea there is that the people are able to get home from their show um, or the bar or whatever it might be. Um, and so that they're the, the um, located in, in the downtown. So that it's not being dimmed as they're walking back to their car after or whatever it might be. Um, that was a very intentional ad to make sure that we're not impacting those, those types of things and that people have that illumination as they're walking back to their car, to the bus stop or wherever they might be going. Uh, okay, so I think I'm reading the within one hour as before one hour, but you're saying after. So if it's closing at 12, you're saying it'll be dimmed at 1 p.m. or are you saying it'll be dimmed at 11 p.m.? I'm saying, uh, at, at one, it would be, sorry, Sandy, um, it would be an hour if bar closes at, when do bars close here too? Um, yeah, so then it would be by three o'clock. Okay, so, so I was thinking as down. within, like before. No, it's after, it's after. Language. The purpose is to keep it illuminated. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Yeah. yeah then, okay, that's better. Okay. Um, Dorothy or Shalini, did that answer? Okay, uh, Dorothy. Well, I have some some remarks here. I just um, number one, just to remind everybody of the absolute basics that when we go out to talk to people, and it's and and Paul has responded to some of this. Okay, streets, sidewalks, and safe lighting, and and beyond that, a lot of people don't ask for too much more. Okay, um, and I am. When it comes to lighting at night, I'm not interested in theoretical. I'm interested in what is. So like Shalini, I wasn't quite sure what 70% meant, what it looked like. So I would like to have a practical test and take a piece of our bad sidewalk. Now, actually, the town fixed up one of the worst ones up on uh, Upper Amity. Um, it picks up a little bit. But one reason why I, I said I can't draw, walk home from the Amher Cinema at night even though I live just blocks away, is because the sidewalk is dangerous. I think that uh, um, Myra Ross made an excellent point about uh, having to see the sidewalks and some of our sidewalks. We know we have a huge list where and it's going to take years for us to catch up on the sidewalk. And some streets have no sidewalks and they have to walk on the roads and the roads are in very bad shape. So you, it's really important to be able to see where you're walking. And I don't know what 70% is. So I would like to see what that looks like. Um, the, you know, I, one of my arguments I have with my husband, he likes to say, this should do this, this should do that. And I say, I'm not interested in should, I'm interested in is, okay? So, and for me, that means I have to see it. Um, the other thing is you've had concern about the downtown businesses and bars, but um, I don't know the bus schedules, but I know that we have workers who actually use the buses to go to work and that, you know, often they have to come home late at night. So I would think that in uh, you know, incongruence with these bus schedules, 
that bus stops should have adequate lighting for, for when people can still be coming home at night, because that's pretty scary. I mean, I have to admit, I'm, I, I have luxury in life. I don't have to do that, but I have done that. I have done that. And it's spooky. Um, and we want to make sure that that's safe. So those are, those are my comments on this. I, I mean, I can, I see uh, on this point, no point in having unnecessary light when it's not needed. But um, so I'm just concerned about being sure that we know when it's needed and that we have adequate light that's safe for that. Thank you. Um, I don't know the answer about a test. I think that's something that we'd have to ask Alfred about if that's what that would look like or if that's feasible. Um, and I can uh, I can write that down to ask him uh, if that's something that they can do. I don't know if we can, I don't know that we actually have the technology in our streetlights currently to dim them. I believe that we do not. Um, that was one of the things, that was one of the specifications that we were trying to put in um, is that as we switch out streetlights that we're replacing them in a way that we can dim them in the future. Uh, but my understanding is that we do not currently have dimmable streetlights to test this way. Yeah. Paul, I don't know if you, if that's your understanding as well. I think that's what I'm remembering. I think that's true. We, um, we do and not, then the, we do not. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then the other thing is that I um, am not familiar enough with the full bus schedule to know when the last um, the last trip is. I don't know if anyone else knows that. Anika, I know the one by my house, but that's all I got for you. Yeah, I'm almost 100% confident that the bus, the, the buses stop running before the bars are out, mm -hmm. before the bars get out. So too. We would probably see a bunch of people congregating as well to get on the bus. And I think this is why you see a lot of people walking. The um, latest. Yeah, we do not have, I mean, like the, the transportation here doesn't, it, I mean, we don't have a very late um, any transportation system here. So the late night service, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, did, I, I found it. The late night yeah. service, which is Thursday and Friday only, the latest one is uh, 12.51 p.m. Yeah, a.m. Yeah. Yep, yep, you're right. Yeah, so, yeah, so, mm -hmm. So that so before the, that you're right before the bars close would would stop um, before they're open. Now here was my question because seeing as um, like specifically for you know downtown and, and areas that there are um, that there's heavy traffic. So if the lights aren't, excuse me, if this is was clear in your proposal because it was there, you know, I, I thought that it was very clear, but. The, if the lights are dimmable, if they're able to be dimmed, does that mean that they could also just, you know, stay at that same, stay at the same, like at lit at a hundred percent without going to 70%? I mean, would, is this would be on a timer? Yeah, it would be on a timer or if we got really fancy, it's um, through something that they would, they are able to control at DPW, but one way or another, it's not, um, it's, it's adjustable. Okay, so the it, so, you'd have to yeah sorry. So the idea of going to you know more efficient lighting can still go, and then so would so so I guess my roundabout quite long with a question is with this so this dimming to seventy percent is it would this have to be um, set in stone because I mean we do have you know to the their point there is you know there would be a lot going on downtown at. At certain times that that could mm -hmm. be complicated and especially just in heavy trafficked areas, I mean, we have the same lighting depending on whatever, whatever condition the sidewalks are in, you know, um, and I have seen like I'm a little more familiar myself with just the, the dimming and uh, dimming of lighting and I don't know the exact percent that I'm familiar with, but just that mm -hmm. dimming and I know that there's a a difference what you can see and that's also dependent on you know how how many lights there are and how spaced out there are and, and all that um but it but is there wiggle room with that at all so i mean i think there's it, it yes there's wiggle room but i think what would be important is to recognize that if if the dimming if the other option for dimming were to not dim at all then it's not necessarily worth us investing in the the special lights that can dim right so uh, I think that's the, that'll be the question. I also, I mean, Mandy said this last time we met, but um, reminding folks that the 
the timeline for swapping out these lights is further along than is further out than we when than we initially thought. So we're talking a couple years at least down the road, if not five. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, I guess it, yes, there's adjust. My understanding is that you can adjust all of those, and the council, as keepers of the public way, can adjust the policy at any point. Um, I think that the question that I I think would be more intelligent of us is to sort of decide soon whether or not that's something we want so that we're not investing in infrastructure that we aren't going to utilize, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. No, it does, it does. Um, okay, so I wanna make sure I've captured the, the comments. Um, Shalini, you want, oh, sorry, is your hand up? No, no I'm sorry, let me put it down. No, I, I think Shalini was raising her. Yeah, I had one more question. I think I was just trying to get to the last part where it asked uh, Paul to within six months come up with a plan. And uh, I just wanted, and I know it's a 10 year implementation plan, so that seems fair, but I just wanted to hear from Paul given that everything that's going on, is that something reasonable for you and have you, yeah. Yeah, so it's six months plus an additional six months if, if needed. Um, so I think certainly within that time frame. Uh, it's doable. I think the challenge for the plan is going to be it's, a, it's always going to be subject to funding, right? So there can be a plan if there's not money available, then it's only as mm -hmm. good as the funding. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's something that we would want to look at when we build our budgets, whether we're going to budget for the, the implementation plan or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the only other thing I would make is I think the comment is in there that the town shall buy the most efficient light. And like there's a that's a you know yeah that can be a a, a big I worry about what that really requires because there could be something that's cost you know a thousand dollars versus something that's hundred hundred dollars that's but I think that um, you know we all know what that what that most efficient light means. I was going to say we we did try to uh, define what most efficient means, including cost, uh, installation, and labor. So those are those would be factored in to the um, to the efficiency as an equation. It's not not just the most yep. kind of climate okay. efficient. Yeah, Dorothy, uh, I would be a lot happier if we didn't have something that was this fancy and regarding on technology, which might cost a lot of extra money, and spec and just kept the focus on the shading and the downlight that that you that was definitely part of this um i can't imagine that getting a light that a dim that a street light that is dimmable isn't going to add a lot of cost and also have a chance of getting out of whack uh things happen to street lights and um that means it be end up being very expensive and we'd say what did we ever get into and then you have a street light that gets stuck at what it is and it won't come back on again um it just to me adding a whole layer of of difficulty and cost when uh, your two points, which I had no problem with, was to do with choosing a, a color that worked uh, better for birds and wildlife, um, and yet was you know going to do the job. And two, making sure that the, uh, the, the screen, the aperture brought the light down and didn't get to unnecessary uplighting. And I, I, I think that the dimming of the thing is just adding a lot of money and cost in the area of, of uh, great aggravation for the DPW. So I, I don't want to put words in DPW's mouth. I would I would caution us against doing that. And I also think that we want to make sure that we're we're not ignoring the flip side and the reason why we would be dimming, which is is efficiency in terms of, of cost over time and sustainability and health. So I think that you know there are there are complications with making any change. And it's important to remember that there's also reasons why we do wanna make that change, right? So um, if, if for you that coin comes down on the side of it's too uh, complicated or, or whatever that might be, then that's your prerogative. But I, I don't want us to lose the fact that what dimming does do is makes the environment healthier. It's, it's more sustainable in terms of our climate and ultimately it's less energy usage. And so it's, it, uh, over time, the idea is that it would be less costly. Um, so I think that that's that part of it. Um, in terms of the, the technological nature of, of policies like this, you know, I mean, Mandy and I talked about this and I think one of the things that's, that's tough is we, our, our responsibility is to 
educate and understand so that we're able to write and pass policies on this kind of thing. And, you know, we talked about this in, in council a week, well, gosh, I can't remember what meeting it was, but, you know, the, the idea that sometimes, sometimes bills come from counselors, sometimes they come from staff and uh, to limit it one way or another, just because of technological expertise, I think is, is limiting both groups. So um, that's that's my my kind of philosophy on that. And if if we differ on that, then that's again that's okay. We each have our vote. But we uh, we would be voting on this with no idea of cost, and I I find that troublesome. You know. So so we have some idea. Um, we're not going to put cost into the policy. We um, we recognize that there is there are cost implications, but we also were trying to write in that these are being swapped out as we go. Um, and that costs change. And so to put in to put in cost estimations at this point um, into a policy would would be unwise. Um, we also really did try to make sure that this is budget conscious and putting in um, putting in the the different caveats about why things might need to be shifted, right? So how we define efficiency includes considerations for cost. How we um, how we look at what fixtures to put in does include uh, does include um, considerations for cost. So, you know, I mean, I think that the other element of this is that we can also change these policies as we go. Um, and if for some reason things become exorbitantly more expensive, then um, we we could, the council could vote to change this back again uh, or to something else entirely. But um, the goal here is that we are, we're swapping this out, swapping them out as they die to mm -hmm. make it more efficient so that we are spending less money and making our environment um, safer. I do, I'm trying to find at one point there were cost estimates and I'm trying to dig through my email quickly, but I can't pull them up right now. I can't seem to find them at this exact moment. Well, can I, can I respond to your last? Um... Oh, of course. Yeah. Um... The phrase, we can change it back, is, is sounds good. But you know, when I think of the time that we spend on doing any little thing and how long our meetings are and our committee meetings are, that's not a comforting phrase to me. Um, I think that getting good people to run and serve on the town council is going to be dependent on making the workload better so that people who have other jobs and other responsibilities can do it and bring themselves to this thing. So. I mean, when I think about all the meetings that I attend virtually or whatever and, and listen to and stuff, it's not easy changing anything. So I, the fact that it could be changed, it would mean going through all this again. And I, I must say it's an exhausting thought. So that's not a comforting thought to me that it could be changed because everything can be changed if you have the stamina to put up with it. You know. Oh, trust me, I'm I'm very familiar with the stamina that it yeah. takes to change policy at this point. Yeah. Uh, I, I think what I mean, Dorothy, and, and I, I recognize it's probably not, and I don't necessarily intend it to be a comforting thought, but I think mm -hmm. my, my purpose is that we, that would be our prerogative, right? I, I more meant that we have the ability, should someone be so upset by it that they don't like it and want to change it, right? Like that, it's more of that's within our purview. Um, not, I didn't mean it flippantly as like, we could just do it, right? I meant more like that is within our right to do. Um, and I apologize if it came across as flippant. No, it didn't, it didn't. It was not. It was not anything to do with your tone, Anna. It's just my sense of the reality of mm -hmm. what it takes to change anything. That's yeah, all. I mean, ideally, we've been we've been you know pouring over this to try to get it right and not have to not have to go and edit anything after. That's that's the idea. I got it, Shalini. Yeah, I think two things that I would feel more comfortable uh, before voting and. And that's just how I think, and that's why you know, just to that's that's my consistency and how I'm thinking through all the policies that are coming through, like the waste hauler bylaw. Why we haven't voted? It's a very straightforward bylaw, but we're waiting for the cost to. And of course, they're slightly different. That's probably going to be. We don't know. It's probably going to bring down the cost. We don't know, but we're waiting to get the estimates before we, you know, we're inviting the TSO to have a conversation. So my mind is going similar to what Dorothy is saying. It's a little, uh, it's, a, it, it, I don't see how we can, without having, I know it's going to change, you said in the future, but can we look at what it would cost now as a, to get a sense 
of what are we committing to? That's number one. And secondly, I think that the second one is maybe easier, but is just to maybe show and explain this, the what the impact of this is going to be to um, and get the feedback from um, the business community, and uh, and and secondly from the, um, the disability and advisory committee. So the draft that the DAAC had, um, I believe, is the most updated draft uh, based on on what Myra shared earlier. Um, I can confirm that, but I believe that they've been working on the same draft that TAC had. So TAC and TAC has always had the updated um, one. Shalini, can I ask what your recommendation in terms of when you say the business community, mm -hmm. um, how do you define that? So I can only think of um, like when we did the rental, the stakeholders were landlords. So we went to through the down, you know, the town to reach out to the landlords and uh, did the bulletin boards and did all of that. Just like inviting people generally to the public comment, I don't think cuts it. So in this in this case, in the least, I think. Um, getting the bid to maybe send it out and talk to them at least like what is this something you feel that and the chamber at least those two and then I don't know if there are other I can't think of other if there are other business um, groups that could give feedback that if this is something that they feel is important enough for them to send it out to the businesses or or do they or maybe at least if they can give some at least just having a conversation with them i i, I know i'm i'm just really i'm struggling to know who them is and i want to be inclusive in my, said, um, in my sampling said so, the and the chamber okay so so the bid and chamber leadership or are you saying that we you want us to talk to all of the bid and chamber members the leadership and like I was saying, you can talk to the leadership if they think this needs to go further than the leadership to other members So just having a conversation with them to get some feedback and I don't know if there are other groups. Those are the two that are coming to my mind, so I apologize if I'm leading leaving out any other. Um, business groups that. Um, could provide feedback on that. Okay, um, I've written it down, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, Dorothy? Well, I, I would imagine that each business owner would go outside and take a look and see where the street light is compared to their business. Um, thinking of front doors and back doors um, because of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's people, pedestrians on the street and it's also just general safety. And if they found that the lights were in good positions, they'd probably, they'd say, oh, it's fine with me. But I mean, it gives them a chance to check and to see how this might impact them. And, right, and and just in it, we're not changing anything about the positions. Yeah, right. I I I, I know that, but um, I I just say go 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 carefully and go slowly, and to know what you're doing uh, in terms of how this is how this impacts other people, and and Shawnee is is trying to say let's get a little bit more input from at least one group of people. Okay, and, yeah, and I mm -hmm, sorry. And I, I get her point. I think it's about. I heard it, and I and I wrote it down. I appreciate it. Um, any other questions? Thank you. All right, uh, Anika, back to you. Thank you, Anna. Okay, sorry. Bear with me for just one moment. Okay, now. Our next topic item here is proposed town staff updates. And this was expanded on thankfully by Anna and Paul. Uh, we kicked this off a couple of weeks ago with uh, Sarah Barr coming to give us a community update. And the idea here is inviting town staff and department heads. Uh, Paul and I touched base um, Briefly, and thinking about you know trees, of course, uh, roads, as we know, uh, would be an issue, and, and sustainability. So the the idea here is to have a discussion based on who we, as a committee, or what departments um, might want to see to come in, 
um, and have a discussion with, whether that's um, presentations, a little more of an intimate setting than if this was out in an entire uh, council meeting and could possibly roll out that we would um, decide here, discuss who we would like to see and then filter that through Paul who would be able to see who and what and when, uh, when is who is available and when that works and maybe do an alternate schedule like looking through our, um, our schedule, our meeting schedule rather that we would have you know someone come in and talk with us maybe that's once a month or you know how it fits best in the schedule. Uh, so I want to, before we open the discussion, see if there's any other input from either Anna or, or Paul, and then, you know, open it up to see what other ideas that everyone has. So, Anna? Yeah, thanks. Um, I appreciate you putting this on the agenda. I think when, when I had initially talked with Anika about this, we were talking about uh, doing at least annual updates again on the paving plan for roads and sidewalks, mm -hmm. um, as Jason had come in last year and done. Um, that was very helpful for us, but also uh, I, I know I'll speak for myself. I've utilized that recording with my constituents and the data from it. So um, I thought that including that on a regular basis would be great. Um, and then I also had thought, you know, um, possibly again, Paul, I'm, I'm just throwing these out there. So yeah. with respect to your staff's time, um, bringing in Alan Snow to talk through our plan for tree uh, management, especially as we are seeing the emerald ash borer show up more and more. Um, and so tree planting and, and management, um, as well as some updates possibly from um, probably Dave or Aaron, jo Aaron Jacques about um, conservation land management. Um, those were the ones that came up for me in terms of specific town stuff that I uh, think would be helpful for us to hear from mostly to respond to resident um, resident concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely, and just to add to um, echo on a, the, um, the roads and sidewalks presentation has been really helpful. We've used that in a couple of the, the district meetings and, and those that were there have, you know, really appreciated that and um, were able to have a, you know, have a copy for themselves to share with neighbors. So that was, that was great. Oh. Yeah, so I think this is a terrific idea. Um, and I think we did learn a lot by the roads presentation last year, which, and just to be honest, you know, the staff would really appreciate the opportunity to make these presentations. I think your meetings are more conducive to a conversation than a council meeting, although I think a lot of counselors will be interested and should be invited to these meetings or they can watch it afterwards. And I think the idea that we do these and we then package them up as little videos that anybody can watch at any time, oh. like we did with the roads is really good. The things that we had talked about, I think roads, uh, trees, I think is an important one because that's gonna become a big policy issue, not policy issue, but it's gonna be a big issue for the town mm -hmm. in the next few months. So we need to get that out there. Conservation land management is something I'm sure Dave would love to talk. You just need to have a several hour meeting, I think to accommodate that. Um, and the other one was sustainability efforts. I think people would appreciate updates on that. Those are things that come up a lot. And there's not a, the ECAC does talk about that a lot. But if you want to give a broader venue to that, um, <coughs> that would be up. That would be up to you. Um, I mean, there's just lots of different folks who, you know, if you wanted them. But I think we could start with three or four and see. You know, that would get us to the fall and see how how that how it works out for you. Mm -hmm. John? I could I add to that, and this could be down the road because I can see the more urgent one being the road, sidewalks, <coughs> sustainability. But also, if we could get the staff to talk about um, recycling and composting and all, because my husband and I are always arguing this goes into the recycle, this doesn't go, or this is not clean enough. And, and he'll just put stuff, and I'm like, no, this is going to contaminate the other stuff. And I think a lot of people don't actually know. I, I, you know, I think that's a, that's a really good one. Uh, I think that's one that we would want to seize on Susan Waite. She knows that stuff better than anybody, anybody on our staff. Yeah. So when she's presenting, let's we can carve out some of her time to do that. That's a great idea. Because there are a lot of questions about that stuff. Yep. And just saying, started composting. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe that one could also coincide with the next uh, 
holler when the holler is is on the mm -hmm. uh, yep. so we seem like we're so we're shaking up our meetings dorothy well uh i just discovered on the town website today uh town council what greatest hits or something and how easily the meetings were and i thought oh that looks great so well you're talking about a video i would love a video welcome to the dump or welcome to the transfer station which where the different people could show you this is what we do here this is what we do here you know the camera just going around and showing you what you the the, the systems because i didn't have to do it all these years but when my husband had his foot surgery i found myself doing it um and i was total novice um, and I'm sure I rode the wrong way in many places and didn't know, put something in the wrong place um, because we're still going to have the transfer station, I believe and hope. Um, and um, things are kind of spread out. So not always so easy to, to ask. You don't want to bother people. I think that could be, they could have fun making it actually. So that's my suggestion. Sounds good. Any others? Any other thoughts? Oh, Would I, like I to see here? Mm -hmm. Dorothy. I, I did have a question. The the area that we never talk about is because we don't really have much of a department, but that is social services. But I know that we have various people who do various things. I think it would be really interesting for us to kind of get maybe a, a, have about five or six of the people who do the different parts um at a meeting and and each could talk about what they do when they don't do and when they call move it to another lane or go to the go to a state thing or because like if you if you wanted to get help for somebody in your family or somebody on your block um at the moment i don't know what to tell people too much um but i know we have some kind of we have some some services some services or at least referral of that type but it's kind of not very clear well our services are for seniors that's the only thing we really and we have a lot of services. We help direct people and, and refer people who are homeless. Mm -hmm. uh, um, everything else is pretty much a lot of those other services that are private entities that provide it that we that they collaborate on. Obviously, the police collaborate with them as well as um, fire and crest. Um, the family outreach, for instance, is a yeah. big collaborator. That's what I was about to say. Yeah. Like a survival center, family outreach. But when I went to some of the senior meetings. Um, there's a certain I can't remember the name of it, but there's a a, a, a charitable group or or social service group that does the meals on wheels or there's um, there's connections made, you know. Right. So the senior, the senior the senior center does the meals work. on wheels. Yeah, the yeah. senior center does the meals on wheels. Right, but the, but there was I, well, I mean, for example, the young man that got um, killed on the subway today who was acting totally erratically. Um, in public, um, if you have somebody that you that is behaving um, bizarrely and in a way that might be dangerous or threatening, um, we just call the police or call Cress or um, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, if you you think sometimes I was talking with somebody about this the other day and like thinking about some of the resources, there was um, a couple that they weren't aware of either survival center or family outreach of Emerson, like the differences. And so we we're right. talking about how like survival center is more of like that the emergency room, if you think about it that way, like kind of where you go to get patched up, are you are you, you know, they're looking if you're not dying, you're patched up and there you go. Whereas family outreach of Amherst is for, you know, more of like kind of connecting with that primary care. So that's more about long term and but but I think what we're saying I think what we're saying is that there's it's sort of a disconnect it's a connected but hard to uh, navigate mm -hmm. social service network and I think it, we could that would take some time to pull together but I think it's 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 a something we could try to do because I think that's mm -hmm. um when you when you're first entering into the world if you have a a parent if you don't live in town and you have a a parent or uh, someone how do how do I gain access to services so let me think about that one yeah and those are two uh, great ones. The other one, gosh, it just popped right out of my head now that you said the um, the senior center and maybe uh, something on their um, their their lunch services there. Maybe mm -hmm. um, 
Haley and uh, Donna, Donna Hancock, who was, you know, pretty much instrumental in that mm-hmm. throughout the pandemic. And, yeah. And so still- I just think, you know, it, it, and I think this, it's fine for the DSO committee to think about this, but, you know, it's, typically committees are sort of like we have an action to take so we should be making work on an action so this is sort of changing how you approach things you're sort of like i just want to gather information be educated and um you know and i think that it was successful with the roads because we've utilized that information and it's there's not another place we can just sort of do it ourselves but the the sort of dialogue that came between the counselors and the town engineer was very valuable and that's that elicited a lot more information than he just made it as a presentation so it's a slightly different approach to your committee work as opposed to having we've been delegated something we have to get it back to the council mm-hmm. Anna? yeah and i i mean i want to be mindful of that and so i think establishing a cadence and um a process for it so that we're not pushing off our actions that we need to take because there's plenty there's a lot that's on our plate right now um, so that we kind of have a regular cadence, but that we're not spending, we're not pushing aside our, our kind of duty and responsibility um, at, the, on the same, at the same time, right? Like we have reporting deadlines back to council on things. And so um, I think that's, that'll be a consideration is how we spread these out. And that's why I was thinking like once a year for paving and one, you know, um, yeah, so that we're not neglecting what we have to get back to the to this mm-hmm. whole team. Yeah, I mean, I think that, yeah, I totally agree that it would go without saying that we'd have to deal with what we have had handed to us, what we have on, on our list first, um, but just, you know, seeing as we do touch on, on town services, I think that there is some information about certain departments that some people don't know. I mean, maybe we'll widen our audience and we'll have three people, um, but you never know. Dorothy. Um. I just wanted to mention that years ago um, in Sunnyside, Queens, uh, we, some volunteers put together a little booklet called The Problem Solver, in which we put, we laid out as much information as we could about services and how you contact them. And right now, I think that it would be pretty hard to find your way through the town uh, website. I, so I, I am suggesting that someone, I'm not saying us, okay, uh, make a paper as well as a virtual thing which is just imagine i'm new in town in fact you know the old days they used to have welcome wagon be the kind of thing that you would give somebody when they moved into town and say you know here welcome and here's some of the things about the town uh expecting people to find their way through the um on the internet uh it's not not that successful in in lots of ways but um so i i'm suggesting that i think that that needs to be done because it takes a long time to find out where things are and what they mean um, and I, I know that some of the TV group, t, t, uh, Zoom groups with uh, senior citizens are kind of trying to work on that uh, a little bit. But again, um, when you're dealing with um, older people um, and maybe some people from other cultures, uh, the first thing they do is not necessarily go and find their way around the town website. Um, they might need something simpler. And that's something that could be translated as well, could be translated into Spanish and maybe a few of our, the other languages which are in town. Um, and I'm not saying we do that, but I'm saying that it could be a project that we could be um, help support in some way. Thank you. So, uh, Paul, are you, do you have that this short list? I do. You and we'll, I'll talk to staff. Okay. I think I, I've, heard, I've heard your priorities and we'll sort of see you know, where where people are and um, I think roads seem, I'll talk with Jason about the roads. It might be once we know exactly what our bids are, we might wanna wait till we get our bids in, which is the second, we're about to submit the second issue of bids. So right. uh, mm-hmm. we'll know how much more we can do. Okay. Can I ask Paul if, if the prices have continued to go up? Do you know, or have they stayed steady from last year? Actually, the bid that we just did, which was Pomeroy and West Pomeroy, were was lower than we anticipated. So, yes. oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Thank you, mm-hmm. thank you. Hopefully, that trend continues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's pretty exciting. All right, so we are going to move into the town manager appointments. 
And Paula, you continue to shake it up. This is great. Um, I'm gonna hand that over to you. Would you like to walk us through? Sure. So this is our first time that we were pointing to the Amherst Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. This is a board that is created by state law. Three of the members are elected and they're elected at the same time you are elected. And so there's some transition language in the charter that helped with that, but that's that's up and running now. There are two other positions. So there is a tenant member, as this is all required by state law, and then there's a state appointee. The stuff start with state. The state appointee is appointed by the governor. When the governor doesn't fill that position, and it's after a certain number of days, the authority reaches out to the Department of Housing and Community Development, saying, "We really want you to appoint someone." When they don't respond to that, or if they say no, it, it reverts to the uh, town to go through its normal appointing process. Uh, after being so, we and that's where we are in this situation. So we posted the vacancy. There are people who applied who'd like to serve. And so I am appointing James Linfield of 71 Country Corners Road as the person to serve as a state, state appointee. These terms are for five years. Um, uh, Mr. Linfield is, um, uh, and this would be the, the gubernatorial appointment. He has worked in housing development. He is, uh, he's worked at Wayfinders. He's done real estate development. He's done property management. He comes with a whole, um, menu of, of really strong skills. Um, he couldn't, he was interested in other committees, for instance, like the housing trust, but he really can't because he could have a conflict because the Wayfinders is always doing things there. So this is the place where he felt like, and he really wants to be giving back to his community. So this is, a, it was a golden opportunity to get him engaged. Uh, and the housing authority does a lot of rehab of existing buildings and they, and so it's, it seemed to be a really nice, um, skill set match for what the housing authority needed and what he was bringing to the table. The other position is a tenant member. So if if you there's two processes. One, if you have a local tenant organization, there's one process. We do not have that. So if you don't have a local tenant organization, you the um, authority reaches out to all the residents of their um, uh, of their facilities and say, would you like to serve? And then if someone's interested, they submit their name. Um, and we followed the same process for appointment. Um, and so we had, uh, we interviewed folks who were interested in that. And then, and I'm appointing Mark Barrett, who is a tenant resident now, uh, before moving to Amherst, uh, he, he lived in, uh, um, in the housing authority, um, property in Belchertown and he was a commissioner in Belchertown. So he actually had experience being a commissioner, um, and, you know, but he like, I am not an expert on these things, but I've served, so I know what, what it means to serve. Um, he has been volunteering his time at the senior center. Um, and he has also been volunteering uh, at, in, uh, um, in Belchertown. He offered his services to help start a rainbow coffee hour and to um, work with LGD, LGBTQIA plus um, organizations to get folks or, organized at the senior center. So he seemed to be a real um, good um, addition to as well, because there was no, um, I think the, um, there was no expect, there was no ramp up time for him to be able to start to serve and be educated. Um, so the people who, who were on the interview team were me, the chair of the um, housing authority, who is, um, Michael Burkhart, and he couldn't make one of the interviews. So another member from the Housing Authority, Nancy Schroeder, sat in on that. Uh, the, the executive director of the Housing Authority, Pamela Rogers, and Meg Gage um, from the Residence Advisory Committee. So these are the two appointments. Paul, can I ask a uh, sure. clarifying? I, I drafted a motion. I can do them in the same motion, right? Because it's the same appointment with the same expiration. Yep. Yep. Okay. This is really, do you, this is exciting. Um, I had a question about the terms, but you answered it. And then is it common practice for the governor to not, to let this, to just let that go to the? Yeah, this has been vacant for a long, long time. I mean, Connie Kruger was the last person to hold that seat, which is before she was on the select board. Wow. Yeah. Right. Do you know why that is? Sorry for question, or is it just 
I don't know. It's, you know, the, the governor has probably so many appointments. This is a very small housing authority. It's probably safer for them not to appoint someone than appoint someone they don't really. And there's not a lot of interest in folks right. serving on housing authorities. There's not a lot of cachet in serving. It's, it's, they're reviewing bills. They're, re, you know, talking about siding on buildings and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a lot of interest in it. I'm ready to make a motion unless anyone else has questions. I don't want to cut people off. Take it away. All right. Wait, I said I was ready to make a motion and then my screen went away. Okay. Uh, I move for the Town Services and Outreach Committee to recommend to the Town Council the Town Manager appointments of Mark Barrett and James Linfield to the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners for terms to expire June 30th, 2028. Second. Thank you. Okay. So were you seconding or were you asking for a second? I was doing both and I did both. Great. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I took it from Dorothy. But okay. I love it. It's, it's a good move. It. <laughs> uh, Dorothy. You're, you're muted. muted Dorothy. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Shalini. Yes. Anna. Aye. And I'm an I as well. So that is four with one absent. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I see Mandy is with us. Welcome, Mandy. Hello. Hi. For having me. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Um, we're going to hand the floor to Mandy, um, that we are really uh, just in time coming in under the water for the surveillance uh, policy. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us again tonight. Yep. And walk us through the floor. Okay. Uh, I think Paul has asked me to walk through too. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna try and you guys, did you guys get only a draft with everything accepted? No, we had the new one added. I oh, posted sorry. both. I posted the, yeah. the markup and the clean version. The markup one, okay. Um, I have to pull up the markup one. But um, so basically I, I wanna thank Paul. Um, I met with Chief Livingstone and Lieutenant Daly um, and Lieutenant Daly is the um, officer, the lieutenant who deals with all of the policy directives is my understanding. Um, and it was a very good meeting. Um, and the, I guess the, the impetus for the meeting was where I was here last time and I was concerned particularly about some conflicts between the Directive 18 that was referenced in the policy Paul provided and, and incorporated by reference in that policy and the policy itself. Um, the the new draft um, or the new proposal that Paul has uh, that the manager has proposed um, resolves all of those issues. You will see there's a lot more revisions than just that one issue. Um, while we were in the meeting, um, uh, the Lieutenant Daly and, and the chief re looked over everything and noticed that there might have been some other conflicts between the directive and the policy. So that's that's why there's more. So the first the first big change is to the purpose. Um, um, and that is basically pulling in the directive that the policy number 18's purpose statement into the surveillance use policy purpose statement. So now they match, which was my biggest concern because they didn't match before. Um, the, the next big change is to the um, data retention section. And the concern, I, I had originally no concerns of it, but the concern came from Lieutenant Daly and the chief when they read the policy that's on page six, I guess it's still on page six of the, the town manager's proposed policy, it did not match um, the Directive 18, Policy 18 from the APD. And so the recommendation was made to make them match and then also indicate that the data that is not saved for evidentiary purposes is overwritten within seven days. And that was sort of what the original draft um, proposal from, from the manager said. And so we kept sort of that language and clarified what that meant and then pulled in the rest of the policy directive language or, or much of it. I think I think the manager just referenced the, the data retention schedule because it's actually kind of long um, in policy directive. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so trying to keep things short. Um, public third party data sharing was changed to delete that last sentence about public records requests because it's really covered in section G. So it was more of just clear clarifying things. And then when I was there and since we were going through the whole thing, I asked them, is it only the state DA's office that um, they might share with for evidentiary purposes and, and prosecutorial purposes? And they said, no, we sometimes do the attorney generals. So might as well add the attorney general in. Um, and then the other biggest change was auditing and oversight. And that was just more of a, a naming thing um, more than anything on that. The one thing I thought would be helpful for TSO to learn, know that I learned in my meeting was much of the policy directive, um, number 18, the one that has been adopted by the APD that, we're trying, that, that the manager has recommended we incorporate by reference here, is uh, pulled directly from the post standards. Um, and those standards are required to be adopted and used as the language is provided to maintain accreditation from the police department is what I was told. And so a lot of what, so that purpose statement, if we were to modify or conflict with what's in policy directive 18, um, the chief and the lieutenant indicated we would potentially risk accreditation because we would no longer be in compliance with the post standards. Um, from the, the I don't know what year that law was, but that the created the post commission and all of that. So that was one thing I learned that many of these directives are taken directly from those best practices, post standards that have been put out there. And so we kind of don't want to mess with them, which is why we've changed everything in the manager's suggested one and nothing in the po police policy directive. I think that summarizes basically everything. Thank you. Anna. Mindy, when you were talking about the third party data sharing, and I think I'm following what you're saying, those are the only two groups. There would never be an instance where that data would need to be shared with, say, the post commission. Is there? Oh, you're muted. I forgot I muted myself. They did not mention that. Um, I, I guess to be safe, you might. One thing they did mention and all was sometimes when there are complaints. Um, I don't know where that, we were looking at section K, complaints, um, mm -hmm. and where you would submit complaints to this. They are required to submit those complaints to post um, from the police department. And so I hadn't thought about that as third party data sharing. I don't know whether, what the procedures are with those complaints, whether they would submit yeah. any, any video or anything to that with the complaint if there was a complaint yeah that's i mean that's kind of the that was the scenario i was thinking of right like if if that was and i don't know if the post commission is the only group in that instance either and so i don't want to like i don't want to i i don't want to both limit our ability to have folks have complaints properly investigated and i also don't want to like cut off yeah i don't want to accidentally over allow at the same time like the the purpose of this is to protect people's data and privacy and yet we want to make sure that we're able to utilize the post commission as needed um, okay let me I'll, I'll i'll noodle that and <laughs> see if there's a workaround there because it's also possible the post commission would go through the regional da in some way maybe okay I'm thinking out loud. I'm not, I was not necessarily expecting you to have an answer. I don't know, Paul, if you have any knowledge or insight. The post commission's so new that I don't mm. like 2020, but yeah. Well, these are public records and uh, you know, they're they're saved for seven days. And I, I so if someone wants to request the information within seven days, but I think this is the idea, the concern I think that this one of these things generate is that how long are you going to save the information of my traffic stop? And we don't, we want to have a, a, if you have to save it for a good reason, then that's what, what's your policy for saving it. But I think the in, the initiative on this came about is that there's not this store of evidence that the town holds about everybody's traffic stop for forever. So. Dorothy. Yeah, uh, when I read through this, um, I just realized that it's it's very complicated. So I'm pretty much 
willing to just go with the the post standards because I on the one hand I could see wanting them to have saved the, the tape if I thought uh, and I might not know that I needed it seven days uh, if it, if I thought it might help my case but on the other hand d- data is so manipulable that you know that doesn't necessarily mean that you could use it so um, it's it, I think you're damned if you do and damned if you don't it's really really tricky. And um, so I, I'm willing to just go with the post on ideas on this one, because it's very complex. Anyone else have a question or comment for Mandy or Paul? Okay. So I have a question then. So uh, to for a motion on this, would this be to recommend that the town council adopt the surveillance use policy as amended? So it's the amendments are being submitted by the manager. Um, so it's it's and I don't know if if maybe look to Athena if, if we have to say as amended, um, which it probably it would. Go ahead. My suggestion was as presented at the TSO meeting on today's date. Okay. And I had I had language, Anika, if you want. Yes, please. So the my suggestion would be to recommend the town council approve or reject, I guess, if that's your if that's your preference, the surveillance use policy for in cruiser video and audio as presented to the town services and outreach committee on May 4th, 2023. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna see if I, I'm sorry, can I bother you to say it one more time? To recommend the town council approve the surveillance use policy for in cruiser video and audio as presented at the town services and outreach committee meeting May 4. Okay. Okay, so I move to recommend that the town council approve the surveillance use policy for in cruiser video and audio as proposed at the town services and outreach committee meeting on May 4, 2023. Second. Thank you, Anna. Okay, so I'm gonna call it Dorothy. Yes. Shawnee. Yes. Anna. Aye. And I'm an aye, so that is uh, four in favor with one absence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Have you, I assume you've finished lighting? We can go back to it. We didn't vote, and there were some questions that you might oh. have answers to that I did not. I did not. Oh. I, I have also to not go back. I was, was going to say I wrote them all down for you, so um, I figured I would reach out to to um, talk through them at some point soon. We'll do that. I just like, since I came in late, I had no idea where you guys were. <laughs> them, so. Okay. Thank you. Thank. Thank you. Good night. Okay, so wow, we've moved through this. We do not have minutes to approve this evening. And are there any announcements, anything that anyone would like to share? No? Okay, well, we have another early one. I guess we're on a roll from the last two council meetings and now this. Uh, so thank you all for being here and uh, See you next meeting. I believe that is the 18th that we meet. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody.